Hey everybody, it's 12 o'clock on, on Wednesday, February 17th. This is Teddy Burris. I'm, uh, I work for a company called Burris Consulting. Look, my, my business partner broke down and let me buy logoed shirts. I've never had a logoed shirt before. Does it look good, Randy? It does, man. I don't know where the, the budget must be uh, deep pockets, it. Buddy. <laughs> deep pockets, man. Our credit cards stack up high. I love it. I need to get a, I need a logo. I need something here or here. I don't know what, but wait, I have my, uh, pump, my pumpkin shirt on today. This is kind of fall-ish, don't you think? Oh, yeah. I, I hey, uh, for, for those that don't know me, the company is Burris Consulting. We're all about LinkedIn strategy, training, and coaching. And 48, 49 weeks ago, I ran into my buddy, Randy Wooden, and the two of us decided, let's have some fun together. So that's why we now own noon Eastern Standard Time every Wednesday. We own it, Randy. We are a global conglomerate. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> hey, hey, dude, would you do me a favor? Yeah. Introduce yourself to my friends. You bet. Yeah, uh, Randy Wooden. I called Teddy, I don't know, almost a year ago, it seems like. And we said, hey, why don't we put a show together? Everybody got sent home when COVID hit, so... It all started back in April of, of this past year. But again, Randy Wooden, I work for Goodwill Industries of Northwest North Carolina. We are one of, oh gosh, about 155 or so separate and distinct Goodwill territories around the country. But we are the only one and the first one to have a very standalone, just for our program or just our Goodwill, to have a professional center. And I was fortunate enough to be asked to be involved with that. So I'm their director. And as you might uh, expect, we help people who have probably a degree or maybe have been in a salary job, maybe a small business owner. Again, professionals, however you want to define that. So if you're out there and you're in transition, you can reach out, find me on LinkedIn. We're happy to help and we're free. Now, I always tell people, Teddy, you get what you pay for. Right. <laughs> we're free. And, and Abby said she prepared. She prepared. Well, that makes one of us then. So that's, right. that's excellent. So let's, let's do this. Teddy is going to monitor the chat box. So let us know where you're calling or watching from. So yeah. that's one thing. So we get people from all across the country. What well, are especially Randy, based on the chat, we got nobody out there, buddy. What? Oh, there we go. Carol's here. We got one person's here, Randy. <laughs> well, good. Carol, you got the room to yourself. So uh, you know, make yourself comfortable. So now oh, we've got Boston. Boston. Yeah, Boston over yeah. there. Yeah, some Boston. Uh, Abby Donnelly is our special guest today. Abby, I've known you since ooh, the early 2000s. And Abby is joining us today. We're going to talk about executive presence. What is it? Um, how does that impact our job hunt? What about when we're on the job? How do, how, how do we exude that presence? Because a lot of us aspire to move up at some point, whether it's with our own company or current company, that is, or maybe moving to a different company with the idea of, you know, promotion, moving up. So how do, how do we get there? Is there a secret language, a secret way that people act? And so we'll find out more about that. Teddy, what you got? I, I'm hoping you didn't miss making sure that Abby tells our friends who she is. Oh, no, she's going to. Yeah, I'm going to throw it right there right now. They're freaking out. They're all on there going, who is this lady? And why you guys got a smart person on here? <laughs> We all like smart people. So, Abby, you know more about yourself than I know about you. So let's tell folks who you are and what you're here to talk about. All right. Terrific. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here. <laughs> you both are definitely fun. <laughs> so I think you've got a great franchise started here with 45 programs under your belt already. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about me. So I'm the uh, founder of the Leadership and Legacy Group, and um, I've been doing that for about eight years. And my business is focused in three areas. So we work with business owners and CEOs to help them develop their leaders, to prepare them for succession so that they can take over the company and run it profitably and sustainably. Mm -hmm. And if the owner is planning on selling to a third party, they still want a really strong management team. So getting those folks in place and being able to run the company is important. The second area that we work on is we work with a lot of folks that are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. And um, folks in their 50s and 60s may find themselves after a long executive career laid off or um, and they haven't had a look for a job since college. <laughs> and it's, it's quite a different world, as you well know, Randy. 
for mm -hmm. looking for a job when you're um, in your 50s after 30 years of not having to do that. And so some of them are in that position. Some of them are in their 60s and they're thinking, you know what? I've had a great run and I have one more good career in me, but mm -hmm. this isn't it. I want to do something different. And so how do you make that career change at, at that age? And then the last category is folks in their um, 60s and 70s that are you know, ready for something I would call post-career, where they are not necessarily looking for a job, but they don't want to sit in the, and they don't want to call it retirement. You know, that sounds like something that, you know, they're not ready for yet, but they, they don't want to sit on the front porch in a rocker either. And they, they know that they can't play golf, you know, seven days a week and find that meaningful and rewarding. So they're looking for some sort of uh, next chapter that, that fits for them. So I work with them to, uh, I have a process to help them define that. And, um, and make it happen. And then the third area of our business is around strategic planning and facilitation of that process. So we work with a lot of companies to help them um, put a strategic plan in place and then make sure that it is executed. It doesn't become another notebook on the shelf. Hmm. So, um, so that's me. Um, I'm originally from Poughkeepsie, New York, and I've been in Greensboro for 25 or so years but twice i moved away and then came back again oh did you oh, no so mets fan or yankees fan <laughs> well i would probably say um it depends on who i'm talking to because i remember my first uh, baseball game was a mets game my dad took us down to the stadium uh but my father's a yankees fan so i have to say yankees uh ooh, okay well teddy it's too late to get another special guest today so i guess well i'm a Sox <laughs> fan red Sox fan so so Abby, I, i'm i'm not prejudiced of anybody's special interest sports so thank you for being here all right thank let's you. get let's get started abby i've known you for a long time and and you had a career uh, in, in a fortune 50 company i don't know whether you care to mention it i'll, I'll let you do that if you choose to uh, but you for somehow left there and are somehow sitting where you are today. I always ask the why question. Was there something that triggered that change, that passion for what you do? What's the why for you? Um, that's a great question. So I did have a career of 14 years with Procter & Gamble, and um, I had a great career there. I learned a lot. I moved around a lot, and I traveled a lot. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I kind of reached a point uh, in my late 30s where I realized that traveling 42 weeks a year for three and a half years is a lot. And I wanted to take all the skills and experience that I had gained through that career into my own business and have a little bit more control over, you know, where, where I was day in and day out. And so I started my business in, um, in 2000, late 2000, early 2001. And I did it primarily because I felt like the work that I did in my last couple of roles at Procter & Gamble was exactly the right work for me. But in the environment of having to move every several years and then be on the road so many days each year, it really wasn't conducive to any of the other things that I wanted to incorporate into my life. And so that's, that was the driving why. And since then, I have to say that I have absolutely loved this work. It's been really fun and, um, and rewarding for me, hopefully for others as well. <laughs> Awesome. I, yeah. I would wager, Abby, that the, 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 your impact in the corporate America world was predominantly focused on corporate America. Whereas today, even though you're working with businesses, your impact is very, very personal to individuals. Yeah, I think that's a great uh, point, Teddy. And I think that um, one of the things I didn't realize when I was in corporate America, because, you know, my father also worked for IBM for almost 40 years. And so my exposure to corporate America was much larger, but I had no idea that there was this whole other world out there of, you know, small businesses, medium sized businesses that are doing amazing things. And I'm so grateful that I've had the opportunity to get exposed to that and to, you know, invest in those businesses and the people that run them. Yeah. So, All right. So let's uh, let's dive into today's topic. And today's topic is executive presence. So first off, let's start with a 
definition? How are we going to define what is executive presence? Um, so I, I did a little bit of research on how other people define executive presence. And there are a number of terms that I really liked. And I, I couldn't narrow it down to the one or two that I thought was going to be the like the ideal definition. So I want to share a few words that I think speak to what executive presence means to me. Um, to me, it's about being able to project confidence, being able to command a level of respect, being able to influence others in, um, in meaningful ways, and yet being both competent and likable so that you, are, you come across as someone who is capable. And the interesting thing about uh, likable and competent have either of you done any research on gender differences around, um, like around executive presence? Not specifically, but I, I, but I would I know I've heard of conversations in that context. I just haven't delved into it myself. No, no. Well, what's what's interesting, and I'm not an expert on this by any stretch, but uh, what's interesting is that, you know, people look first to understand if you're competent, but they're going to decide on you know, their opinion of you on whether you're likable. And from a gender standpoint, it appears that women have kind of a double standard where they have to be seen as likable, much more so than men do. But in order for them to be likable, they may give up something on coming across as competent. And so it's a really tricky line for women to, to walk because of that distinction. And men really don't have the same challenge with that. But I, but I wanna be liked. We all wanna be liked. I like you, Teddy, isn't that enough? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Abby, I'm, I'm with you and, and, uh, uh, and, and we got an amen sister from uh, uh, Wanda. Uh, and, and and I get it. I absolutely understand it. And um, and, and I um, I want to. I really do want to look at uh, all people in the same way. I want to. I want to like them and understand that they're competent. I, I really do. I want to start with: Can I like this person? And then can I dig deeper and learn about them, and discover where do they fit in the picture? You know, executive presence or whatever role. So I'm with you. Yeah, and there's there's the uh, the old thing we do business with people that we know, like, and trust. So know, like, trust. So there's the like and the trust, the competent part. I feel good about this person. The respect piece. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and those things take take time. So now that we've got some definition around this thing, why is this important for somebody in a job search? Why can't I just be <laughs> myself? I mean, I'm myself. Here's my resume. Hire me. <laughs> right. Right. So, um, so it's really important in a job search for a couple of reasons. First of all, as you both know far better than I do, and Randy, I think you've been in this field for a very long time. Um, you know, in a job search mode, you have a very short amount of time to make an, a good impression on somebody. And in that time, they've not only got to figure out if you're likable and competent, but they have to figure out whether you're going to fit in their culture, whether you're going to be able to deliver the results that they need in their particular environment, whether they can count on you, whether they want to spend 40 hours a week with you. Um, and what additional value beyond the particular role or job that they would be hiring you for, what additional value can you bring? Because, you know, they're hiring you for work, but as you're going to be there 40 hours a week, you know, they've got to figure out whether you can bring enough additional value that makes you the top candidate. Because these days, you know, there may be several candidates that can do the job, but which one's going to be the best fit for a particular company and culture? And, you know, I, um, when I was, I've done quite a number of presentations over the years for job search groups. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that has always been interesting to me is when, when we lose our job, when we're laid off, when we face some difficult times at work and we're really desperate to find a new job because um, either we expect our company might be sold or might go bankrupt or, or we're just not happy there anymore. 
we can kind of get into this mode of desperation and um, whether it's real desperation, like, I don't know how I'm going to put food on the table if I don't get a job in the next week, or it's emotional desperation of, I was, I just feel so badly about my work environment or how I was treated. Then we, that starts to get in the way of the experience that others may have of me. And as hard as it is to kind of put that in a compartment during your job search and only take it out when you're home or with good friends that you can uh, trust, you've got to do it. I mean, you've got to compartmentalize and put that away and show up with that executive presence to anybody, whether they're an interviewer or they're in your network, because you never know who's going to be making an assessment or an evaluation, even when you're not interviewing. Yeah. So. Yeah. And if someone has a question or a comment, please put them in the chat box. My good friend, Teddy Burris, uh, majored in that in college as far as uh, monitoring the chat box. So he is right on top of things. So make him work. Okay. Cause you know, he, he's got the logo shirt and you know, so he's, he's riding high now. So just keep an eye on Teddy over there. Will you, uh, companies look for a, a combination of competency and culture fit. And I think the competency piece, you need to be able to articulate how you've driven profits or, you know, what have you. So I think we all, we all agree on that. So the, the, the culture fit, I guess, is that kind of squishy topic. And that, that's really what you're talking about is how do I fit into the culture here? So, but culture kind of goes two ways. I mean, you are what you are and the company is what it is. And do you have any thoughts on, okay, I'm a job hunter right now. And as I, maybe I have an idea of what I would like or the culture I would like to operate within, what are some things I can be on the lookout for if I'm that candidate and I'm going through the interview process? What are some indicators that says, you know what, this place might be the good, the good spot for me? So I, um, I think about culture as being driven by values and the, the values of a company kind of define the culture, but we don't see the value. We don't specifically see values. We see behaviors that represent values. And so I think understanding what your core values are, the ones that really matter most to you if you're looking for a job in a work environment, and then identifying what are some of the behaviors that someone would need to exhibit to for you to say, yeah, that probably represents the values that are important to me. And then looking for those behaviors, either when you interview for sure, you know, the, the folks that you're interviewing with, but you can also see things that indicate culture um, just on the walls of a building. I remember when I was with Procter & Gamble, I, tr I told you I traveled a lot. <laughs> and so I was at a lot of different P&G locations and you could get such a good sense from the, about the culture simply by noticing what do they hang on their walls? What do the people talk about when they're in the cafeteria over lunch? You know, what, what do they dress like? You know, are they showing up to work looking sloppy or are they dressing, you know, in a, in manufacturing, we never dressed in suits. So are they, are they dressed in, you know, nice, uh, a nice set of dockers or something like that. And so you can tell things about the culture by what you see in the environment around you. And you can compare them to how they fit with your interpretation of those values and then how they fit with how you feel. Like, do you feel good being there? Have you, have you Go ahead. Now, I was just going to ask, what have you seen in terms of indicators that match culture? Yeah, good. Um, <laughs> I got one for you. I used to be a headhunter back in the day uh, when I got started in this field. So we're talking early 90s. And a lot of what we recruited on, we recruited in consumer durables, uh, the whirlpools of the world, the tier two automotive you know, suppliers, that kind of a thing. So a lot of manufacturing, right? And one of the things I always looked for, uh, I always wanted to go on a tour of the facility because I felt like I could get a vibe for the vibe, <laughs> whatever that means. But one of the things I looked for was this specifically, because <clears throat> they'd give you a tour. And when they give you a tour, they're giving their, the, the plant manager is putting his, back then it was a him. I mean, they were all him back then. Um, they, but they were, they were putting their, their best foot forward. 
Now here's, you know, we're giving this guy a tour. So everybody shape up. And one of the things I look for culture wise was when I was walking with the plant manager through the facility, I would look ahead to see the people, the workers. Okay. And they always, you know, they're popping their head out. Hey, who's coming. And if they saw that it was the boss, some of them would turn the opposite way and walk away or ignore. Mm. Okay. Other ones, when the boss and I were walking toward, and again, we, we weren't mingling, we were going through, you know, stayed between the yellow lines, but other times the, the plant manager, the people would, would turn and kind of walk away and walk toward us. And the manager knew the names of the folks. And I thought, wow, what a difference in the one case, oh, here comes that SOB. I don't want to, oh, man. And the other one is like, Hey, Teddy, how's it going? Man, that's a nice shirt. Did, did, did your wife pick it out for you? <laughs> she actually, she did. Point, point, being, point being that there was a relationship there. Yeah. And and so to me, anyway, that spoke volumes of, of, you know, when they talk about teamwork and they talk about, you know, working together. I think that's an, an example of that. So, Teddy, maybe you've got to. I'm going to add to that. And I asked our audience with, with their thoughts and, you know, you yeah. know, they're throwing out, you know, waiting 30 minutes for an interview and, you know, intimidation factor from the boss. And, um, you know, should we uh, Ross asked should, or excuse me, Rose asked, should we go look at the company's website to get a feel for the organization? And I, I offer, I mean, yeah, you should look at the company's website to get an insight, but that's the marketing document. I mean, you know, everybody yeah. says, look at the website to get a feel for the company. And I don't believe you're going to truly get an intimate feel of that department in that company by looking at a website. I think you'll get an <laughs> idea but you won't get one of the things that I encourage people to do is everything we're talking about and all the ideas that the, the folks have dropped in the chat here, but listen to the words and how that person delivers those words when they're, when they're talking with you. If you ask a question about, you know, uh, diversity in the organization, listen to how that person speaks about diversity. Now, if they can speak right. to it with, with passion and clarity then you know that that's not just a uh, a book on the shelf they were told to use. So Abby, what are your thoughts? I totally agree. I think that's a great point. I think the words matter. And um, and I'm also looking at uh, Jimmy Barnhart's comment here that uh, he talks about how safety features in manufacturing operations show respect for employees' well-being. And I think to build on your point, Teddy, you know, the words are a piece of it. And then I think the the things that they seem to prioritize, the things that they and you'll talk about the things that are important. And so it's it's both the words and the things that they choose to talk about when you're not directing the conversation. Yeah, good point. Real good point. And uh, we need to pay, be paying attention to all of that. Randy, back to you. Well, yeah, I see Carol put in here about a CEO of Inagon years ago, knew the names of about 1,100 employees and would ask about family members by name sometimes also. Uh, I've got a, a friend of mine who was a plant manager at Procter & Gamble, one of the diaper facilities. So I don't know, maybe you've had the pleasure of a tour of a diaper facility, but he would, he would always send a, 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 a um, whether a Christmas card, or I think it was a birthday card. He had the birth dates of all of the uh, employees and he would send one each time and make it a point to go around uh, when it was their birthday and assuming they were on the job that day to, to say happy birthday. And we yeah. Could, Appreciate what you do. So a lot of, a lot of good to be had there. All right, let's, let's pivot just to, for a moment here. And some of this we've kind of touched on a little, but let's, let's bring this to the forefront. And that is behaviors and mindset. You talked about behaviors and mindset as it relates to executive presence. What do you mean by all that? Well, I think that um, behaviors are the things that people see. And so executive presence really only can show up in terms of behaviors. But to the extent that behavior drives or your mindset drives behaviors and your behaviors drive your mindset, you know, there's a lot that going on in here that shows up whether you like it or not. And so if you can be very intentional about what your mindset is focused on, then you can be much more intentional about your behaviors. And so some examples of, 
you know, when I think about behaviors, I think about, you know, this video camera. So if you turn the, the, um, the volume down and you put me on mute or something like that, you would see my behavior, but you wouldn't necessarily know what I'm saying. And so the, it's what you see. And then it's also some of what you hear too. So, you know, there's, there's the obvious things around body language and facial expression that are telling you something about the, the experience of that person. So when, when you're thinking about executive presence, it's an awareness of how your, your facial expression and your body language is showing up. But it's also around you know, partnering that or marrying that with dress. I mean, I thought very intentionally today about what I was gonna wear because if you're gonna do a program on executive presence, you wanna look executive-like, right? So I wasn't gonna wear my casual um, Zoom um, where I was going to wear a, a blazer because that's going to, you know, present me more of the way I wanted to. I got and, that memo, Randy. I got that memo. <laughs> oh, sorry, Abby, go ahead. No, it, it's great. And so, you know, when I think about um, Amy Cuddy wrote a great book on called Presence. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that she talks about in there is the power of your, your, your physicality, you know, and some of us have to work differently than others because of that. So if you're a six foot two, you know, 250 pound man, you have a very different physicality just showing up than I do as a five foot three and a half, you know, light petite woman. And so we have to show up differently because of that. So one of the things that Amy Cuddy talks about is she talks about, you know, the power pose. And she suggests that if you're going into a meeting where you need to have executive presence, physically putting yourself in that power pose position is a great first step because it tells your mind, I am competent, I am confident, I can command respect, and I am going in that meeting now. <laughs> and it's a little bit different than being arrogant. I saw that Steve Miller said, you know, what's the difference between them? There's a big difference between arrogance and confidence. But sometimes we have to do those things to get our mindset right so, so that we support our behavior with that mindset. So Abby, what I just heard you very bluntly say is that executive presence starts in my head and I need to do everything that I should do to get my head focused on presenting myself in the right possible way, including the way I dress and including the way I talk. Uh, solid point, thank you. Yeah, Teddy, about halfway through the show today. Yeah, let's go ahead and do our halfway show. Um, uh, hey everyone, thanks a lot for showing up. We got, uh, we've hit 42,000 people on the show already, Abby. <laughs> And, uh, and I looked over, by the way, on LinkedIn, and I thought I saw about 10 people live on LinkedIn, which is a good number to have at one time. So, hey, we have uh, Abby Donnelly. Abby's uh, uh, the founder of the Leadership and Legacy Group, and the conversation that Abby's having with me and my good friend, Mr. Randy Wooden, is all about executive presence during job search. So, Abby, thanks for joining us. Randy, back to you. Yeah, I got, this is a sexist question, so put your oh, seatbelt on. You know, you're a self Describe five three or whatever petite. And a okay, half, so five three and a half. Five three and a half. <laughs> and and you're good petite. memory. <laughs> and you're petite. So and you're female. So the fine line between being a bossy whatever whatever and likable and yet competent. Uh, do you have tips for those who might be much like you, who are female and petite, and how they can exude the presence without coming across as I've got to prove how tough I am and I'm going to grab your hand like it's a, a you know a vice grip and I'm going to just <laughs> squeeze it and is there a happy medium and how do we find that if we're female and petite or if we're a tiny male and we have a high-pitched voice maybe we don't come across as that masculine and we sound like this I mean those are all things that people pick up on how do they we, are how do we, yeah how do we compensate for some of that well, I think part of it is what Teddy was talking about is getting it right in your head. You know, if you think about yourself as a petite 
woman, yeah. um, then you're going to come across as a petite woman. Um, and if you think about yourself as somebody that has earned the right to have an opinion, has earned the right to have a seat at the table, then you know that's the first piece of it is getting it straight in your own head and reminding yourself that you are competent and you are, you know, you do have something of value to offer and um, and not second guessing yourself as much maybe as as you might like to. So I think that's a piece of it. Um, I also will tell you some of my own little tips and tricks is that uh, for me, I will always dress one level above or a half a level above what I think the particular situation calls for, because um, I feel like I've got to do that to command a presence. So if you told me it was a business casual meeting, I'll probably still wear a jacket. I may not wear a formal suit, but I will still wear a jacket. If you told me we were coming in jeans, I might still wear a jacket, but I wear you know a, a lesser level of um, of pants. And so I think that's you know that's part of it. And then there are some other things that you can do with your with your body language and physicality. One of the things that somebody taught me years ago that I, I thought was just interesting is when women go into a meeting typically, and again, this is just, this is broad stereotypes, um, but typically they tend to take up less space. They tend to have their little corner, you know, they'll sit at the, around a table and they'll keep their things neatly in front of them. And one of the tips was when you go into a meeting, you know, don't be sloppy taking up space, but take up a little bit of space, you know, spread your stuff out in front of you get a little bit of elbow room around you. Not so much that it looks like everyone's, you know, creating a gap around you. <laughs> right. And then, you know, I mentioned the power pose before, but, but doing a little bit of that before you stride into the room. So those are a few things, but there's, there's another one that I want to spend a little bit of time on. And that's our communication style. Um, I think in general, people. So anyone that's lacking confidence, and it could be men or women, it's, this is more attributed to women than men. But if you, if you talk as though you're unsure, or, you know, you use statements like, well, you know, I don't know, I'm thinking maybe we should, you know, if you, if you approach it that way versus approaching it from the standpoint of my recommendation is, and your tone is steady. One of the things I hear a lot is people who their tone at the end of the conversation goes up and that actually detracts from executive presence versus your tone being uh, either steady or actually dropping down at the end of the conversation. Yeah, I think that's called up speak. We had Margaret Morris on some months ago to talk about it when it ends like this when we say something that ends like this, Teddy, is it time to do your break now? No, and Randy, we've already done our break. <laughs> I had to think of something to say, but point being, it ends <laughs> as though it's a question and that's called up speak. And it's, it's frankly pretty off-putting uh, for yeah. most, most folks. Once you latch onto it, sort of like when somebody says, you know, or like yeah. every other word at some point you hear it. So we've had a lot of comments, a lot of questions. Teddy, are there any in there yeah. that you want to dive into? Tracy, yeah. Tracy uh, uh, relates to the being the five foot four, and I don't. She didn't add a quarter. I thought it was five foot and a quarter, four and a quarter, petite lady. She yeah. dresses a bit better than is, is expected. So kudos to Tracy. And uh, we'll, uh, Joseph wants to talk about ageism. Uh, we can we can t chat about that a little later if we have time permits. Uh, Wanda says, she for, uh, I forget the privilege being tall. Now Wanda's a little bit taller than you, Abby. Um, <laughs> so um, so I, I told Wanda I've always looked up to her uh, for more than just her height. Well, the other thing that uh, Wanda said that I thought was a really good comment, I wanted to bring it up is around women stop prefacing their comments with I think, or I just wanted to say, and that's true. Um, but I also believe that you can say, I think, with confidence, yes. and it won't have the same, it, you know, it's better not to say I think, or, you know, I just wanted to say, but if you do, when you say it with confidence, it can also be an effective um, executive presence move. I, I can see it, Abby. I can say, I think, um, 
Uh, and that right there very clearly tells me you didn't think clear. But if you go with, as you just said, I think what's important for us to do is X, Y, Z. Now there's confidence and there's executive presence in that statement. And I think to Wanda's point, women in general will tend to apologize a lot. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And uh, one of the books that I read, I don't remember which it is, said, or articles said, banish that from your day-to-day -day vocabulary. It doesn't mean that you don't apologize. And in fact, apologies are totally appropriate, but not as a discourse, you know, not as a communications tool. Yes, we give away power, exactly. That's what Wanda, Wanda said. Wanda doesn't give away power. Wanda exudes <laughs> executive presence. I'm serious. I'm saying that publicly right now. So I, I love this comment. I always, this is Galaxy A6. I always listen to Bad to the Bone before I go into an interview. Now, what I want to know, is that a man or a woman who is saying that? <laughs> yeah, there, there is a lot to, to be said about tone of voice and how we, how we interact. Either you guys remember the the commercial. I want to say it was for a, a FedEx or a shipping company or whatever or something like that. They're sitting around a, a conference table, and the one person says, "I think we should do this." And the other, then the the male comes up and leans forward and he says, "Here's what we're going to do." And he goes like this, and he's moving his hands like this, and everybody's got his their attention on him, but it has to do with the the hand motions and just the presence versus the sloppy dressed guy that just says, well, we ought to do, you know, FedEx or whatever. You guys remember that? Or am I making that I up? I, I think it was a few years ago. It might've been around Super Bowl time a few years ago. Okay. All right. So I'm not crazy. No, so not, not in that context. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we've talked about enhancing executive presence. I think we, a lot of our discussion has been that there's another point we wanted to, to get to, and then we may have other questions too. Yeah, I got it. And that was maintaining executive presence when something unexpected throws us off. Mm. What, what, when you say unexpected, what, what, what you talking about there? Um, sometimes something happens in an interview that we did not expect. You know, um, I can think of some, or, or some very important meetings. So an example for me is I'm in the middle of presenting something uh, in an interview and someone barges into the office where I'm being interviewed and interrupts. And, you know, there's this uncomfortable moment of like, well, okay, I clearly have to stop talking because we're being interrupted here, but, but what do I do? Do I, do I go back to where I was before? Do I let them, you know, the interviewer kind of take the lead and, and what happens if they, if they don't respond in the way I expect them to, or, I mean, all kinds of things can happen that can kind of throw us off our game. And I think that's, that's really what I was thinking about is how do you, you know, how do you respond if something throws you off your game? And, you know, there's a lot of literature out there and uh, the whole concept of mindfulness has become very, very um, commonplace now, which is great because I think it's really effective. Not that I'm good at it, but, but it's very effective. And I think you know, reminding yourself and taking a pause and taking a, a breath and thinking first, you know, not having that rat brain response, but thinking first about what, what message do I want to convey here with my behavior and what words, to, back to Teddy's point about the importance of words, what words do I want to use with what tone mm. to, um, you know, to kind of reset to, or catch myself up or even just ground myself and, you know, remind myself that I got this. I'll be okay. That's self-talk. A couple of, couple of thoughts here. One is that silence is power. Yeah. Uh, very often as a candidate, the employer sits there and just kind of. I, I, like, remember oh, I gotta say something. I, uh, little, 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 and then you puke all over every word you could think of. You puke all over the guy, and next thing you know, you're out of the. You lose the interview. The other, and something that I was I was uh, taught years ago, is to ask questions because mm -hmm. as you ask questions, that helps you to control the the the, the discussion. Uh, so if you feel like you may be talking too long, best thing you could do is to ask a question because it'll force you to be quiet, force the other person to talk a little bit. And here again, you can learn more about what they're after and so forth. Teddy? I, um, Abby, I remember years ago, uh, I told you I, I participated in raising four daughters. 
And um, in my early stages of raising a teenager, teenage woman, um, I did not know how to do it. And so I failed because I did, I failed miserably. And, and I, today I'm, I'm proud of saying that because I learned from my failure. Uh, and the, the other three didn't have to go through it as bad. Um, I reacted way too much. Every word out of her mouth, every thought, everything she did, I, I reacted. I mean, and then this guy, his name is Carmine. Uh, I was working for him back then. He said to me, we have to learn to respond instead of reacting. And so in, as an executive, to exude executive presence, to show that we're competent, show that we believe in ourselves, take a moment. It didn't take a lot of time. Take a moment and think of the right words, the right message, the right response to what's going on when someone barges into your office or, you know, a client throws a fit about something or a hiring manager asks you a question and you're really not wanting to answer. Use that silence because it doesn't take long for the gray matter to come up with a good response. That's right. I love that point. And, you know, one of the things I forget to do myself, but I wish I remembered was ask for a pause, you know, take a break. I think it's okay to say, can we just take a, a minute and, you know, I'd like to run to the restroom or, you know, give me a minute to, to think about how, how to best answer this to convey the message that I want, want to convey here. I also love what Randy said about the power of asking questions. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're asking the questions, not only are we forced to be quiet, like Randy said, but we're in control of the conversation. And, you know, if you want to have executive presence, being in control of the conversation is one of the most powerful ways of doing that. And you're doing it when you're asking questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, uh, unless Teddy, you've got another comment. There's a question I I want to pivot just a little bit to, to talk about some more of what Abby does on when she's not here with us. Um, anything else from the the chat well, area? I, I like I like Carol's comment. Yeah. Carol threw out a comment about she was taught, uh, and I'm and, and and I you know could be by a parent or or a educator to say thank you for uh, instead of I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, and I, I get that. If you're running a moment late, don't say I apologize. Carol uh, adds this: state thank you for waiting for me for a moment. And I do this on a regular basis. I had a client this morning who was two minutes late, and I at, at one minute late to my sessions, I'm reaching for the phone to call you because I don't want to wait for another two or three minutes. I'm okay with the one or two minute, but I want to make sure you didn't forget. It's usually, as I'm calling, I hear the click, and they're coming on. And when he, as soon as he got his microphone on, he didn't say, I'm sorry. He said, Teddy, thank you for waiting for me. That's I love that. Yeah. yeah, that's good. All right. So succession planning, this is something that you do with the, the executives. You, you mentioned that at the beginning of their show today. So some of the people watching today, I know certainly I've had clients over the years, Teddy, I'm sure you've encountered folks who say, look, I'm a job hunter, but for me, the ideal scenario might be to plug in at a company, maybe at that number two slot with then the entrepreneur is within a few years of retirement. And so I can be groomed to buy the business or take over the business. So if that's you, if that's somebody that desires that, what are some tips you could give to that job hunter to kind of get plugged into that network? To where, how do you discover those opportunities? Who do you talk to? How do you, how do you position yourself? Well, I think it's a fabulous concept and it's so fabulous that lots of people are thinking about it, yeah. um, but there are a couple of challenges with it. So I'll talk about the challenges first and then maybe a little bit about how you can try to overcome those challenges. The challenges um, that I see in that are, first of all, there are a lot of folks right now that I talk to that are in their 30s and 40s that would like to own a company one day and they would like to be the successor that will buy the owner out over time and own that company. And it's a wonderful model. It can work extremely well for both parties. And so the concept, as I said, is great. The challenge is that the vast majority of folks that are in their probably 60s and 70s that might be beginning to think about succession, either already have somebody in the 
operation that they've kind of got in mind or have even had conversations with and tapped to take over that, you know, the company from them. And so they're in the process of, of making that um, transition, if not formally in any way, which in many cases, they're not doing anything formally about it. But in their mind, that's the person. Now, what I'll tell you is that a lot of times that's not the right person. It's not the best person. And in many cases, it may not even work out, um, even if they, they move forward with it. But what you've got, the challenge is you've got to get over the hurdle of that owner thinking, I already have somebody. So the, the only way, well, not the only way, but a way of starting to get over that hurdle is to, is to position yourself as somebody that wants to help the company be successful, not necessarily going in with the idea, I want to buy this from you, but I'm coming in, I bring a, a you know, I want to work for you. I bring a skill set that I think can help this company grow. I'm open to the possibility that maybe one day there would be an, an opportunity for me to be in that role as a successor. But I also recognize that you've got 30 years in this business or 40 years in this business. And, you know, you didn't roll over one morning and say, gosh, I really need, you know, Joe Smith to come and, and buy me out. There are times when they're looking for somebody like that. But the, um, the process of getting to that place where you're going to be the right person, unless the uh, successor is coming in with a bundle of money and can really just buy the owner out over you know, a, a year or something like that. But the majority of folks that are looking at that transition probably don't have deep pockets to be able to make that work for them. So they've got to go in and kind of pay their dues and earn the you know, earn the respect and earn the right to have that conversation and do it in a way that doesn't push anybody else that's also possibly under consideration out unless they've they've worked themselves out. Yeah. Abby, I'm with you. I, I like the, I, I get it. I, I see a lot of companies that are already positioned. They know who their successors are. Well, they think they know. They think, okay, and I also agree with you. They think they know. And, you know, you know, cousin junior should be the right guy to take over the job. But there, and, and as, well, as I'm sure you know, there are many companies out there, probably a greater number of companies that are privately held who have not truly thought through that succession plan. Uh, That's then, exactly right. In fact, you know, if you ask them, if you ask people, um, owners, whether they have a transition plan, many of them will say yes. But if you ask them what it is, it, it basically comes down to, well, you know, I'm planning on this person taking over the company. But I've had so many conversations where when I ask more details about whether that person is the right fit, you know, if they've done the research on how they're going to fund it, if they've got the skill sets that they need, or if they're developing those skill sets right now, then we start, you know, wiggling around a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But beyond, with all of that being real, most companies don't have privately held, don't have a good succession plan some of them already have it already figured out, then, then what I hear you saying is position myself as someone who cares. I care. I like your model. I like your business. I like your clients. I like your products. This stuff thrills me and I want to be here to help. And as a position, that's becoming trusted, respected, and liked. And as you're doing that, then you can work towards the conversation about the succession plan after you've shown your value. And I think there's nothing wrong with having an, a preliminary conversation that, you know, I would be interested in discussing whether this might be an option um, because, you know, you don't want to invest six years and then find out the person isn't interested. So yeah. I do think you have, you have to broach that subject, but if you go in saying, Hey, look, I want to, you know, I want to be your successor. I want to buy your business one day. There's a chance that they will be open to that if they've got nobody else. But if their business is really, um, you know, is really worth something, then either they've got some other folks in mind or they're thinking about selling it to, you know, a strategic buyer, a financial buyer. And, you know, you're probably not going to be able to match the revenue numbers. So they've got to really want to sell it to you. Yeah, yeah. You've got to really want it. You gotta yeah. really want it. No, not yeah. just like I want a business, so I can say I'm a business owner. That that 
that doesn't win anything. I'm a business owner because I care about the business. That wins something. So, Randy, back to you, buddy. Yeah, Abby, we've got about 10 minutes left. So if you could spend maybe four or five minutes wrapping up kind of what are the takeaways you'd like us to have? And Teddy and I may have a brief, brief story uh, to piggyback on top of that. But if you could, what are the main takeaways you'd like folks to have today? Um, sure. So um, for me, the whole piece around executive presence, and I think Teddy summarized it beautifully, is executive presence starts here. It starts in our mind. It starts with our beliefs and our mindset and having not just the belief that we, we have earned the right to have a seat at the table, but also the, the attitude and the mindset that, um, that we bring value. And so if we start with that and then we drive our behaviors appropriately because of it, there have been some phenomenal um, pieces in the chat room on input for that and some great links to some other resources that people can look for. But I think recognizing that people will evaluate us kind of no matter what on the basis of how we show up. And if we show up our at, with a negative attitude, that's going to be evident. And if we show up with a positive attitude and confidence, that's gonna be evident as well. And then there are other things that we can do with our power pose and our dress and our firm handshake. And who knows if anyone will be handshaking anymore after the pandemic, but certain, that's right. You know, We'll do an, a fist bump or elbow bump or something. And, you know, things like eye contact are, are really important as well. And so, you know, having, having that physicality to support it, um, I, I think is the, the critical piece of it. And then remember that from an executive presence standpoint with a job search, if you're struggling, you know, if, if you're tired of looking, if you feel, um, if you're sick of being rejected, if your last employer treated you like crap, those are all very, very real feelings. And I think it's critical to honor those feelings and to give them space to show up. And I think it's also critical that you do not bring those feelings and that, that presence into interviews, into networking meetings, into the, uh, the networks that you're interacting with because they're not gonna help you and most likely they will harm you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, we've got a, a few minutes left. Teddy, um, I've got a quick story, <clears throat> we'll make it quick and I'll, I'll get to John's point at the end because okay. that, that's gonna deal with our upcoming guests over the next couple of weeks and I'll, I'll, I'll mention those. Uh, I, had a, I went through a sales training class many, 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 many moons ago. And one of the, one of the takeaways I, I gathered from that dealt with what are called verbal cushions. And I've, I've shared these over the years. So, and this is a conversational bridge example. Somebody asks me, I'm the candidate. They say, so Randy, I see you have not worked in 10 months. Well, that's, that's a tough one. Or if it's Teddy, Teddy, how much is this service going to cost me anyway? Or Abby, what's this going to run me anyway? Eh. Those are the kinds of questions that kind of put you on defensive. And it, they're not questions that you necessarily welcome, certainly based on the tone of the question. So a verbal cushion is something you would say or do that shows respect for the question, meaning I'll get to it. It allows you time to think about what you're going to say and helps to drop defenses. So a, a, an example of a cushion in an in interview, hey, Randy, you haven't worked in 10 months, or I see you've had five jobs in the last two years, or I see you don't have an MBA, or I whatever. You could say, well, I get that question from time to time. Let me address that. Or you could say, Man, if I'm in your shoes, I'd probably wonder the same thing. Let me share some thoughts about that. It's a way, again, to be conversational because it, to your point earlier, you have to have the competency, but you've got to work that within a framework verbally and how you look and all of that in such a way that they'll take it in the way you intend it. And so that, I think, helps to maybe not to the point of executive presence as much as just being conversational and likable. All right. And that is part of what you talked about earlier. So, Teddy, I'll turn it to you yeah, for your story. 
and then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll mention about our next two guests we have coming. Next two special guests. So, um, <laughs> Abby, thank you very much for showing up today. Great conversations, uh, lots of good engagement in the group. Thank you for our, our uh, audience for participating. Um, look, um, you got to walk to walk, talk to talk. You have to look, sound, and act like you want to be perceived in life. And whatever that role is, whether it's a, you know, um, a, a barista at Starbucks, there's a style of the human that is the best human to be a barista at a Starbucks. There is also a style, a presence of uh, the words they use, the, the way they engage with people, their actions, the way they move for all different roles in life. And you have to realize what is the best way for you to present yourself with your words, your actions, your deeds, the way you engage with people, the way you look at them, um, you have to make sure that you are doing the right things to present yourself in the best possible way. And I don't know, Abby or Randy remembers, uh, recently I read an article that says a lot of hiring managers hire based on that perception. I'm sitting here, I'm talking to this lady named Abby, and I feel good about her. I think she'll be a good fit. So they, they're, they're hiring on perception more so than skill. Now, that's a double-edged sword. I get that. But you need to think about that. If they're hiring based on perception, then you better make sure you're, per you're, they, you're perceived as the right thing. So think about your presence, your executive presence. Think about the way you look, the way you sound, the way you speak in order for you to be able to be perceived as the right person. So great, great conversation. Oh, by the way, uh, I'm going to throw out, I'm going to half answer John's question, Randy, but I'm going to get it back to you. Um, executive presence on Zoom. Look, Abby is comfortable sitting in her chair. I'm, a, I'm pretty sure you're sitting in your chair. Randy is comfortable sitting in his chair. For me to, to present myself appropriately, I want to stand up. So I'm standing up. I'm all of six foot 10 minus uh, 12. Uh, I'm, I'm five foot eight and I stand up in front of the camera because I feel better presenting that way. Six foot 10 minus 12 inches, buddy. Is five foot ten. I'll do the math. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, I'm so, with you. Anyway, executive presence on Zoom for me, it's standing. And now put yourself in the best possible position to do it. Randy, back to you, buddy. Yeah, let, let's talk about our next couple of weeks. Uh, most of many of our uh, attendees and a lot of the people who see us on LinkedIn and elsewhere are job hunters. And if you live long enough, if you're not a job hunter today, you'll be a job hunter at some point, or you know somebody who's a job hunter. So next week, we're going to have David Burden on here. And who's David Burden? Well, he deals with executive search. Now, we've had staffing companies on, and, and they do a lot of contract work, temp to hire. But yeah, they do salary, but, it, but they kind of run the, the gamut. So in this case, David's going to be on to talk about the, the VP, the, the, the high level positions within organizations. He's going to talk about how some of their processes from a recruiting standpoint may differ from some of the, the local staffing firms. He's going to talk about retained search. What does that mean? What does that process look like? How do you find good executive search firms? How, how do you find them? And how do they find you? He'll also talk about contingency searches and, and what those are. So again, he's dealing at a higher dollar level, a higher title level when it comes to the searches. And for a lot of our folks, if you're a job hunter, if you're not there now, you hope at some point you're going to be at those levels within companies and that a guy like a David Burden is going to be somebody who's going to find you and you'll live happily ever after. So that, that's next week on the 24th. I've got my calendar on the side here, Teddy. My yeah. my paper calendar. Wait, that is that your your uh, your, your New York uh, football team calendar. It's my New England Patriots. Oh, excuse me, New calendar. England. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, but to John's point earlier about executive presence on Zoom, our good friend Cindy Martin. Abby, you know Cindy, right? Cindy Martin. Uh, she's helped our Goodwill Professional Center for many years at our at our group events, talking about etiquette, professionalism. That kind of thing. And he's on here, Randy. She's on. She's listening. To oh, you. is she on here today? Yeah, oh, I, I better. I better straighten up. Then. Let me set up straighter. <laughs> anyway, now I'm paying attention differently too. Then <laughs> he's going to be on March 3rd, and it's going to be specifically talking about 
your presence on Zoom, whether it's in regular old meetings, okay, uh, or during interviews. What are some of the, I don't want to say tips and tricks, but what are some things you can do to exude that executive presence? That'll be, and also we're going to talk about, and this is interesting, Ted, I don't know if I shared this with you. A lot uh, more and more companies are going to uh, artificial intelligence as far as the interview goes. In other words, there's not a live body on the other side of that little camera right here looking at you. It's artificial intelligence. What are some things you can do in terms of your facial expressions, eye movements, and so forth to try to pass the smell test, so to speak? And I know I, I never could pass the smell test, but that's a personal issue. So I, unless, Teddy, you've got anything else, I think we're about One to more. wrap up. I want to remember our anniversary. When's our anniversary show, Randy? 4-7. April 7th is our April anniversary 7th. show. We have put together an absolutely fantastic show. It's so rich that we may do it for 90 minutes instead of 60. 90 minute anniversary show. Uh, I'm almost ready to promise balloons, chocolates, and, and uh, what's that stuff you like? A champagne. Almost ready. So, you going to get a shirt for me? Do I have to wear the Teddy Burris, Burris Consulting logo shirt? Or Burris Consulting can't afford to sponsor that in that way. Hey, Abby, again, thank you very much for showing up. Uh, thank everybody you. Showed, this was great. Thank you very much. And I uh, will see you all in a week. Have a great day. See you guys. Bye. Thanks, Abby. Bye.